Sorry, I don't love you. A friends have grown accustomed to. Cause with you, something isn't wrong. Something isn't wrong. Something isn't right. I wish you could be happy. Hey everyone, welcome to Geekdom is back this week. Craig Manning returns for another music topic. We are going to be talking all about Jason Isbell, his work as a solo artist, his work with the 400 unit. So basically his six full length releases that he's done. And I personally gave everything a listen once. So I am no Jason Isbell expert. So that is why, (laughs) Craig, you are on. How are you doing today? I'm very good. How are you? Pretty good. Pretty good. I'm very glad that we are doing this podcast because I had heard of Jason Isbell through the country music forums and chorus and everything. And I know you've talked about him quite a bit. And I'm pretty sure I've read some of your previous reviews, definitely something more than free. And I had added that album to Apple Music quite a while ago, but then it just got so far buried in my recently added because of you know people (laughs) sending me records for hi-fi noise and reviewing stuff for course too so it kind of got i think i just like assumed that you had listened to i think i brought him up a few times during the uh the casey musgraves podcast just like assuming that you had, had listened to southeastern and uh, something more than free. So I apologize for that. Um, It's totally fine. I had every intention of listening to at least something more than free. And for me, you know, I've probably said this a lot, but with the amount of podcasts I've been listening to, it's like I kind of put music listening on hold until my queue is basically completely empty (laughs) in my podcast app, (laughs) which takes a long time because I listen to a lot of podcasts. And, you know, for whatever reason, music listening isn't something I've been doing nearly as much as I used to since I've been getting into podcasts more and more. And obviously having Mm. two of my own podcasts a week, that sort of cuts out at least a few more hours between recording and editing two podcasts and everything like that so the music listening time has been cut a lot (laughs) i basically have music playing all day while i'm writing so it's like six to eight hours of music a day and i can't like write and listen to podcasts so music is still the the primary thing I listen to. I don't think I listen to anywhere near as many podcasts as you do either. So I would say most people don't, (laughs) if (laughs) we're being honest. But, you know, I I sort of have this never-ending list of things I want to listen to, things I want to read, things I want to watch. And while I am impatiently waiting to see if I get a job soon or not, you know, I've been trying to make my way through as much stuff as possible. So I did listen to all six albums once and I had every intention of listening to the Nashville sound, which is the first album we're going to talk about here a second time, right before we recorded this podcast. And then I went into the deep, dark depths of Facebook and Twitter ads to (laughs) sort of get something going for (laughs) the podcast for a day or two here. And Needless to say, that did not happen. And even if I had put it on, I would have been so ingrained in what I was doing with the ads that I would not have been paying attention to the music at all. But The Nashville Sound is his new record that isn't out just yet. It'll be out not too long after this podcast airs. June 16th? Is that right? I think so. I think that's right. So is that uh, three weeks from... from So we're recording on on May 25th, and that's three weeks from tomorrow. So you guys will have a couple weeks, pretty much, before you can listen to to it once this is up, and as you guys are listening to it now. He'll probably stream it somewhere. He'll probably have like an NPR stream. But yeah, so you guys get a, uh, a a first impression on the record that most people have not heard yet. Yeah, and I actually started with this one when we said we were going to do this podcast. So this was my first listen of a full album of his in general. And yeah, I'm curious what were what were your first impressions like having this be your entry point? We can compare that to where I started, which was uh, Southeastern a few years ago. Yeah, I think because of the fact that you know he's consistently released an album every two years. 
since 2007. So he's had plenty of time to figure out his sound and, you know, make it a more polished record. And I think the Nashville sound, one, it definitely captures the Nashville sound. There's definitely no doubt about that. So it's very much I, he, he teased it as a as a rock record. But I think it might be like his most country record, which is sort of uh, an interesting like head fake. I don't know if that was like missed like missed marketing opportunity or if they just like wanted to uh, to trick people. But that that um, it did sound very like classic country to me. Yeah, and I think jumping in with this sort of gave me a better look at what he wants his sound to be now because if I would have started with Sirens I would not have you know had any clue where the music was going to go from there because that was sort of his first record rough sketch I mean he had done he was a member of the drive-by truckers I don't think he made it to those no (laughs) uh, songs and like you know they have they have two primary songwriters and they both split songs still to this day on their records. So when he was with the band, they had three primary songwriters and um, he was like, I don't know, 20, 21 or something. So like he was sort of the low man on the totem pole and those were some of the first songs he wrote, period. So he would get like two or three an album, but they're really good songs. But like that sort of didn't prepare him to make an album, I think. Right. So, like, Sirens of the Ditch is sort of, it's a rough sketch, I guess. Yeah, and with the Nashville sound, when I first listened to it, I was like, okay, this I can really get into. And obviously, not knowing what his previous album sounded like, I wasn't sure, because like you said, this one definitely leans quite a bit more country than the other records. And, you know, it's funny. At least the last couple, I think. Yeah, and it's funny because on Apple Music, you'll see some of his stuff listed as alternative or rock or, you know, it's just funny when you look at the genres that it's been given on something like Apple Music or Spotify or iTunes or wherever you get your music. And this one, I immediately felt like I wanted to listen to it some more. But the only reason I didn't was because I knew I had five other albums to go back and listen to for (laughs) this. Yeah. Yeah. And I definitely wanted to make sure I gave everything at least one listen so I could give first impressions. So my basic first impression of this was, you know, this could easily end up on a lot of of end-of-the-year lists, or at least, you know, the ones we start to see coming out in June when people sort of give their first half of, you know, 2017. Yeah, the mid-year stuff. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think it's definitely going to be on those. And I I think it's going to be... I mean, I think it's going to be my album of the year, personally. Um, I haven't heard anything yet that's even really close to this. I just think it's... uh, I don't know if it's my favorite record of his, just because, like, Southeastern sort of really kick-started... Actually, both Southeastern and Something More Than Free sort of kick-started my, like, country phase, which is now the majority of what I listen to. So I don't I don't know if this will be as influential in that regard for me, but um, I've been working on my review for it because I'm doing that for chorus, and I think it's his most complete record, and I think it's his most um, nuanced from a songwriting perspective, because there's a lot there's a lot to unpack in these songs. Um, there's the political stuff, obviously, because um, he's sort of writing in reaction to. Not necessarily to Trump, but sort of just all the crap that's been going on. Right. But then he's also writing in reaction to, like, having a family now. Because I think, I can't remember, his daughter was either born right before Something More Than Free came out or right after. But um, it was was after he wrote all those songs. So, um, like, being a father definitely influences... The writing here so like it's sort of those two those two worlds and he sort of blends it all together into this very personal very deep kind of dark um record but ultimately pretty uplifting um and there are some songs on here that just like 
you you have to stop what you're doing to listen to like the lyrics of them because they're just so like raw and emotional um especially if we were vampires which is actually out there now i think that premiered on npr last week um but that's like about basically like being in a long-term relationship and knowing that someone is going to die before the other person so super uh depressing but also like very moving and um definitely coming from a personal base yeah and from here we're sort of just going to go backwards through his catalog and i think that'll sort of give you an idea of maybe where this album is going to end up as far as the charts and everything because i know with something more than free the album was number one in three different categories which goes to show the genre thing isn't working so well for him because it hit number one in the country charts like country the folk charts rock and folk. was it was it number one rock? okay and then it was number two on the indie charts <laughs> so you know you have four different ones there and it was it came out number six overall which is really great for someone like Jason Isbell and you know the last three records have been released on southeastern records so this new one and the two previous ones which i'm guessing is just his That's own his label. label yeah it's yeah for something more than free it did 143,000 in sales and that is not bad in 2015 at all <laughs> you know especially was that, was that total for the year you know, what I was that first week. Let me I, see. I, I just don't. I don't even remember what it was. I think it was for that first week because it says country album sales chart for July twelfth, twenty sixteen. Okay, no, so okay. that's the full year then, because the album came out in twenty fifteen. Right. But still, you know, if I could sell one hundred and forty three thousand of anything in a year, I would be pretty darn happy about that. <laughs> Right, and he's sort of been, uh, you know, just steadily growing his fan base since Southeastern, which was, I, I would call his breakthrough. Uh, last fall, my parents and my wife and I went to see him um, in DeVos Center here in Grand Rapids, which is like a 2,500 seat, like, auditorium, basically. And I think, I'm pretty sure he sold it out. So, like, to do... Like we're we're sort of a mid level market, and most artists can't do a, a venue that big here. Right. So um, I would not be surprised if he sells more of this one, uh, especially because you know, like since this record, since um, something more than free came out, uh, you know, Stapleton blew up, and Stapleton sort of. I don't know if he modeled himself on Jason Isbell. Like, he obviously had a very long songwriting career before that. But, um, like, he worked with Jason's producer and sort of was embraced by the same audiences. And then he blew up. And then, uh, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if if Jason gets some of that um, some of that traction and sells sells more copies of this one. Yeah, and I would say that Chris Stapleton and even Sturgill Simpson are sort of these two breakthrough artists that, while they might not have the exact same sound as Jason Isbell, they're sort of in the same boat because, you know, they were these relatively unknown guys. And then you have Sturgill Simpson winning awards and everything. And the same with Chris Stapleton. I'm pretty sure at one or all of the country music awards one year he just kind of like swept everything so no, he, he like did. pulled he in a Dell. <laughs> and then like okay so this is a little off topic but like the billboard music awards were on sunday and like they basically just give awards to whatever charted highest right um but chris stapleton won best co or country album of the year for traveler last year because it was the highest seller in um 2015 and then he won it again for the same album this year because it was once again the highest selling country album in 2016 yeah see i don't i don't get that but you know billboard sort of does their 
own thing. No, I don't because... know why those I don't know why those awards exist, but I thought that was funny. <laughs> yeah, and you know, with Billboard, you could have, you know, Prince or Bowie winning stuff just because they died and their stuff, you know, skyrocketed on the right, charts, right. which seems Absolutely. you know, I wouldn't say that obviously that is good for their estates and whoever then owns the rights to those songs and those are two fantastic artists that kind of never really went away and it's just like they don't really care to promote the new music in a way because they're simply right. going off of their charts and they can't control you know like oh wow prince and bowie died so close together and they can't control that so obviously no, no. well the entire like the entire I, I feel like billboard is kind of broken in general and maybe this is just my opinion on the Billboard 200 and how they incorporate streaming now, which, you know, it, you, you probably have to incorporate streaming, but I think the way they do it is a little bit weird. Um, it, it just doesn't really seem like representative of anything. Like, I feel like they should just have a sales chart and a uh, streaming chart and not try to, like, combine, combine them everything, into one yeah. or... Because, like, back to Stapleton, he was number two on the Billboard 200 a few weeks ago for his new record, uh, even though he outsold, he, he had higher sales. Like, he sold more than 200,000 copies, just like sales of his record in a week, which was not only higher than the artist that beat him on the charts, but it was also higher than what Harry Styles did in his first week which is sort of insane if you think about it, because Harry Styles is considered to be, like, one of the biggest stars in music right now. So, like, I don't know. For for these country artists, and this could be true for the first week of the Nashville Sound, too, like, I don't think they get the same streaming numbers as, like, the the pop or indie rock acts. But yeah, I, I feel like agree. they just demolish everyone in terms of, of album sales, because country fans still buy albums yeah i've definitely noticed that because you know i've gone to a handful of country concerts and while they're the more mainstream artists like you know i went to the tim mcgraw and kenny chesney co-headlining tour i saw carrie underwood at the hollywood bowl and i've seen you know like chris young and lady antebellum at amphitheaters around here they sell out stuff so easily because their fans are so willing to just spend money and right you know at concerts that big too i'm sure these people are just drinking so much that <laughs> these concerts <laughs> make ridiculous <laughs> amounts of money because they'll be charging like 13 or 14 dollars for a tall can of beer <laughs> and right. it's crazy right. how much country fans are willing to just get so into the music whether it's live music or buying physical copies of it that they sort no, of it's definitely are like outliers become, yeah it's become more of a uh like thing for venues near me to book um like artists in that genre yeah like a few years ago you couldn't like they had they, i think they have a big country festival like over by detroit um but like in grand rapids and kalamazoo which is where i went to college you basically couldn't find these artists. And now, like, uh, Jason Isbell's come through twice in the last three years, I want to say. Like, we saw him in Kalamazoo in 2015, and then we saw him in Grand Rapids last year. Um, so he's come through twice. Stapleton's coming to Grand Rapids. Um, we saw Casey Musgraves in Kalamazoo. We're seeing Marin Morris in Kalamazoo. Uh, and I think there are a few others that have, have come through after, like, years of not getting artists like this. And um, I just think it's, like, testament to, like, the quality of the music, but also, like, like I guess the, the, the country listeners are more traditional still in, like, how they listen to music. And um, so they'll still they'll still really, like, be fans of artists instead of just, like, like going by the playlist mentality where they'll just put something on shuffle and, and listen to anything. Yeah. And to get back to the album a bit here, when I first listened to something more than free, I actually went through a few songs and then had to pause it and come back to it 
because I ended up, I don't know, watching TV or doing something or, you know, <laughs> I think I ended up doing my Fargo recap last night and then I just never got back to it. But it definitely felt like a good next step after Southeastern. So it's definitely, you know, you mentioned Southeastern is where he sort of really started to get his footing and get more recognition. Yeah, maybe and- we should just do these two together because I think they're sort of companions. Yeah, yeah. And so that. Southeastern, that was an extremely solid record. And I think he sort of really figured out his sound in that one. And in Something More Than Free, he was still playing with his sound to get it to where it is now with the Nashville sound. And it's right. always really great to see artists who are willing to continue to change. And I think we've seen this a lot with a recent example would be Paramore. You know, they started out as this, you know, big sort of female fronted pop punk band. And now with After Laughter, they've gone in a completely different direction. But if you go back and listen to each of their albums, you can sort of easily see that progression of how they got here. But if you just go listen to someone's first album and their more recent album, you're like, wait, what? (laughs) What And I feel like. No, definitely. And I feel like you can sort of get that with Jason Isbell, too, because if you listen to, you know, his very first album and then you listen to even any of the these three, I think you're just like, OK, something happened in between here, but I'm not entirely sure what. <laughs> A few things happened. I can I can tell you some of the stories if you want. Go for it. So uh, the first thing that happened with Southeastern is... Um, he got sober. Okay. Um, and you can like you can hear that in some of the songs. Like "Cover Me Up" is is sort of the uh, like I swore off that stuff forever. This time is a line in that song. Um, but he um, he met Amanda Shires, who is now his wife and the mother of his child, and she is also a um, an artist who makes very good albums. If you have time to check out her stuff, her album last year was quite good but so she basically um i guess gave him an ultimatum like stop drinking and being like self-destructive or i'm going to leave you essentially and that sort of is um is is dramatized in the song songs that she sang in the shower from southeastern um so he he got clean and he wrote this record. Um, and it's just like you can hear that it's so much more focused and um, more nuanced in the writing, I think, throughout than anything he'd done before. Um, and he really like sort of mastered the character, like the writing uh, writing about characters on this record. Like because there's Elephant, which is about a woman who's dying of cancer. There's um, Live Oak, which is about like, uh, a, a serial killer, basically, or at least a notorious criminal who's like on the run. And then there's um, Yvette, which is about like a, uh, a, a high school student who lives next door to this girl that's being sexually abused by her dad, and he decides that he's going to do something about it, and uh, I think shoots him through the window, basically. So there are so many different things going on in the stories of this record, which I've always thought was really interesting. Um, and I just think, you know, when he stopped drinking, he sort of could really double down on, on the song craft. And I think, like, I, I've often said that he is the best songwriter of his generation. I think this is, this album is where that happens. Um, and then the second thing that happened with this album is he started working with Dave Cobb as his producer, um, who, you know, everyone in country and Americana would go on to want to work with. Um, And I think Dave Cobb sort of just helped him center his sound. Like, uh, one of the things that Cobb really loves to do is just, you know, cut an album in in a week or two and not fuss over it too much and and just, like, get everyone in a room and bang out a record. and I think, you know, that that really comes through on these last few albums because they really sound natural and intimate and organic, which is sort of the opposite of where 
like the rest of country music was going in 2013 when like everything was getting progressively glossier and more poppy and then Dave Cobb comes along he's like no let's record an album this way and then his style has become is gone everywhere because he's made the records with he made a record with Sturgill he made both records with Chris Stapleton he's produced for um Chris Shiflett of the Foo Fighters, Zach Brown Band, um, all sorts of artists have worked with him now. So th- there's sort of th- that there's way more of that sound now in country music, and I think this record, I think I said this on the Casey Musgraves album, um, I think this record is the most influential country LP of the decade so far, Southeastern. Yeah, and I definitely noticed the change in sound with this record, too, because, you know, I listened to Here We Rest, but it didn't really stick with me that much. So why don't we go ahead and talk a little bit about that record? Because obviously that is, you know, right before he sobers up, you know, you said his wife gives him this ultimatum, basically. What are your thoughts on this record? Is it one of his that you find yourself revisiting often, or do you sort of find yourself revisiting Southeastern and something more than free? Well, those two, yeah, I like the more recent ones better. I think Southeastern is maybe his best record, and I think I agree with you that something more than free is a really great um, progression from that. I think he used the band more on that record, um, which he does to uh, he, he he also does that on the Nashville sound. Um, Here we rest is actually labeled as a 400 unit release, whereas those two are classified as solo albums, which right is, is sort of interesting because he kept the same band. You know, they were they were there and they they were touring with him and they played with him and they played on those records. But um, I think this album is like half half really great. Like, I okay. think the first half has some of his best songs, um, like Alabama Pines and Go It Alone and, and Stopping By are three of my favorite Jason Isbell songs. And um, he plays the first two at almost every concert he plays, I think, or at least he has up to this point. And, like, it's sort of interesting because on this album there are lyrics where you can hear that he's, like, struggling with, you know, his alcoholism and he knows he should stop um but he just hadn't quite gotten there yet and um i think i don't know if i'd blame i'd blame it on that but i think this album is just less focused right his later stuff and um you know he didn't have dave cobb yet so i think dave cobb sort of was able to hone his sound and sort of help him like what I he I interviewed him actually a few years ago, and what he said is that Cobb is just really good at helping him like shape the songs and like decide like should I start with the verse or the chorus? Should I add another chorus here? Like how should I approach this song? And like in the interviews, he said that the uh, the something more than free song, Children of Children, which is sort of builds to this big epic like guitar explosion. Like, he came into the studio and he had, like, a sketch of lyrics for that song. And then, like, Dave Cobb had this great idea of how to build it into, like, this arena, like, classic rock song, basically. So I think he he was lacking a producer here. And he was also sort of just trying to do, like, maybe, like, write in too many different styles, I guess. Like, this, this album has always felt to me a little bit like a grab bag. Like you get to the back and he's like, he's trying some some bluesier stuff and then like some uh, there's a cover on there and I just I you know he hadn't really grown comfortable with what he wanted to do yet I don't think. Yeah, and I think that sort of lack of focus that you mentioned with the album is probably why it didn't quite keep my attention because you know I'll admit I was listening. I was listening to these albums while I was doing other things because, you know, oh, yeah. I tried not to do like things that I knew I was going to be heavily focused on while I was listening to these. So it was like, okay, let's get some social media posts up for hi-fi noise and stuff like that, that I was doing while I was listening to these or, you know, while I was out walking on the treadmill or something. And for whatever reason, this one, it just didn't click with me 
like you said, I remember some of the first songs on the first half of the album, but I would definitely need to listen to this one again to see what parts of it I liked and didn't like. Right. Well, I think, you know, it's basically the first half is really good and the second half is just kind of there. Is how right. I would like like they're the songs in the second half aren't bad, but um they're definitely not up to the quality of the first half and like I think the the next three records sort of just have have successfully demolished this one. Uh I still go back to it a fair amount, um, which I can't necessarily say for the two that came before it though i was playing like all his stuff on shuffle before we started talking and a few of the songs on um jason isbel and the 400 units sort of stuck out to me more so maybe i should go back to that one i think it's been a while yeah and why don't we go ahead and talk about that one for whatever reason on apple music it only had the deluxe version because i went to the regular version of the album and it just had like seven mile island and that was it and i was like uh i'm pretty oh, sure the album's longer than one song <laughs> i don't know what the deluxe version looks like it has three extra acoustic tracks which i didn't actually listen to because with the three extra tracks it's an hour and ten minutes and i I don't know what my problem is, but anytime I see an album that is over an hour long, I'm just like, uh, why? <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, with this album, this one might have been my least favorite of the six simply because it felt like a lot of the songs ended up being longer than they needed to be, too, because I noticed, you know, you have the coda as track six, and it's just, you know, like a two and a half ish minute instrumental song yeah, and that's weird because like basically coda is reprised for the last song i will write which is the closer like it's that melody i guess yeah um, okay there's four extra tracks then if the last song i will write is the yeah final i just song. looked it up there's a, <laughs> there's okay yeah i i would agree with like this one has never felt particularly essential i guess and i think part of the problem is that all like the the albums that came after this, he always started with a great opening track. Right. And I don't think Seven Mile Island is particularly interesting. So this album just doesn't doesn't really pull me in. I think there are three or four great songs on here. Um, I think Cigarettes and Wine is really good. That one I stood out to me Lights the most. Is really good. And uh, I love the closer on this, personally. I think... Um, See, I didn't even know it was the closer because then there were four songs after it. <laughs> right, right. I thought maybe just well, the it's, acoustic songs. It's the last songs. song I will write, so you can't put that anywhere <laughs> but at the end. Um, but I think that song really makes good use of the band because like, there's this just steady build and then like this cathartic instrumental section to end it, which is like basically the coda piece. Um, but that one I always put on, on playlists if I'm like making Jason Isbell mixes for people or just like having a shuffle playlist to play around the house because I think that is one of his best songs and you know he never plays any of these live which okay. is sort of um I I can't really blame him I think it's sort of his uh least developed record but I would like to see that one live because I think the band could really uh like they 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 sort of when they play songs live a lot of times they'll extend them a bit and just jam and he'll he'll do a lot of guitar stuff and this is one of those songs that I think could fit really well in a set list but he just doesn't seem very fond of this album so yeah and I would definitely say that cigarettes and wine was my favorite song off of this album simply because it was the one I remember the most too because you know I actually listened to one of the bonus tracks then because I listened through 12 songs. Yeah, because there's a bonus I initially... track that's uh, just a B-side, it looks like. Yeah, and I initially assumed that the extra tracks were just the three acoustic ones. And I was like, all right, I can skip those because, you know, they're songs that are already here that he's already done. So I don't necessarily need to listen to just the acoustic versions of those. Although I should probably go back and listen to the Cigarettes and Wine acoustic version since i did like that song so much but this one you know i don't know how much i'll be revisiting probably this one and here we rest but 
why don't we go ahead and talk about his first album, Sirens of the Ditch, and then we can sort of go over some more overall thoughts and ideas, what we think will come next and everything like that. But for me, I actually like this one more than the self-titled one with the 400 unit, because while it's not a very polished record like his more recent three, this one shows just how much raw talent he has. And it's definitely way more of a rock record than, you know, the Nashville sound is. Right. And I think like my main issue with this one and with um, his drive by truckers songs is that I just don't think he like his voice wasn't quite developed yet, I guess. Um, it sounds thinner on these um albums than it does now and now i th- like he's one of my favorite singers now because i think he just really um emotes in a very effective way and sort of just lets loose when he's uh especially live like on a song like cover me up which is sort of his signature song now um like just seeing him sing that live it's it it and then comparing it back to these records it just like he sings with a lot more soul and passion and uh, but there are some really great songs on this record, and I, I'd agree that it's better than um, the self-titled 400-unit record. Um, like Dress Blues, I don't know if you listen to Zach Brown Band at all, but they covered that on their last record. Okay. Because that, that's just like, even even now, like, you know, 10 years later when he's written five more records and he's become one of my favorite songwriters i still think that's one of his his best songs and it's just like it does the the anti-war thing just about as well as you can do it i think um and he plays that one in most shows like he'll go back to that and i can see why because it's just it's it's a heartbreaking story of like uh a young man who basically goes overseas and gets killed and then like the whole town celebrates him but like what value does that have when you know his life is gone his his family is sort of adrift without him and like it it's just a very effective song i'm surprised it's not like the closer of this album because it seems like it would play that role well but that one um chicago promenade and in a razor town are my th- three favorites from this. Yeah, and you know, I'm really glad that we sort of have a lot of similar thoughts on these albums because you are way more familiar with it. Like you can pluck out songs here and there and I'm like, okay, I listened to these once and I don't <laughs> know like unless it was something like Cigarettes and Wine where the title was kind of in the song a lot. It's like, okay, I don't really know which songs are my favorites yet from these albums, but I kind of have an idea of which albums I would like to revisit the most, which I enjoyed the most. So do you want to do a quick ranking of your favorite to least favorite for these six albums? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, If I mean, ranking the new one's obviously hard, even though I've listened to it like 20 times since <laughs> I got the advance. Uh, I think Southeastern's probably still going to be my favorite. Okay. Um, I just think, like, knowing that that, that record sort of um, got me interested in checking out a lot more of this stuff, uh, this country and Americana stuff. And, like, I still think that album has his best songs. Like, Cover Me Up might be my favorite song of the decade by anyone okay at this point in time it's just seeing that one live um it's a very emotional experience because it's so personal to him and like people just like it always gets a standing ovation it's just one of those like goosebump inducing things to see live but i think that one and elephant and relatively easy um and a few others traveling alone and songs that she sang in the shower i think like these are still up there with his best songs so i think uh for now at least i'll rank this one at number one okay uh then i'd probably put the nashville sound just because like i said uh, it's very cohesive and uh, he definitely had a vision and followed through with it and like it's a 10 song record you know it doesn't last 
it doesn't last for over an hour, as you were saying. It, it's very short and to the point, and um, at least it seems short. I think it still lasts for 40 minutes. But um, then my number three would be something more than free. Um, I think I've always felt that this one's a little less consistent than Southeastern. Um, there are a few songs on there that I'm not necessarily crazy about. Right. And he also, this one, he splits over two LPs for the vinyl pressing, which um, is 43 minutes long. So I don't know if that was necessary. And it sort of <laughs> it breaks it up in, in a frustrating way. Like Southeastern's on, on a single record, and it's 47 minutes long. So, you know, this is just a <laughs> side note, like, um, just something that bothers me. It's sort of a pet peeve. Right. That, like, records that are so short, but you're still splitting them off onto, the, you know, four sides of vinyl, and then you get, like, two or three songs a side. Um, that said, I think that Speed Trap Town is his second best song. And that one, um, that's just one of my favorite songs, period, at this point. And I think I like that probably more than any song on the new record. Uh, so this one's probably a close third, okay. I guess. And then I'd probably go, then I'd probably go Here We, Here we Rest, just because like Alabama Pines, Go It Alone, Stopping By, um, those are some of my favorite songs of his. And like, I've listened to this one more than the first two, I guess. Okay. So just, it, I have a better... It, it it sticks in my head a little more. Uh, and then probably Sirens of the Ditch and then Jason Isbell and the 400 unit. Okay, so I would definitely say that ours are pretty similar, even though mine's solely based on first listens for everything. So, you know, I would probably flip Sirens of the Ditch and Here We Rest. So the Sirens would be four and Here We Rest would be five for me, just because... Like I mentioned, when I first listened to Here We Rest, I came out of it not really feeling like I remembered much of what I listened to. So I think for me, right. that was sort of more of a little bit of a downside. But obviously, I do plan on going back and listening to his records more. I likely will be listening to these three recent ones more, and especially the Nashville sound right now, because... I'm going to see if I can listen to it enough to form some thoughts on it and get a review up for Hi-Fi Noise. Since you are covering it, of course, you know, we can both get mm -hmm. our reviews up for it. And, you know, I think it'll be cool to see if after a few more listens of either all of the albums or just even these top three that we have, if I still feel like that everything would be in the same order that I have it in now. So what's what's your number one then? It would be southeastern as well. Do we have the same top three? And you just yeah. You, okay. So all I did was flip sirens and here we rest, and then everything else is the same. Gotcha. So you know, like I said, it makes me pretty glad that you and I have very similar thoughts on this because I know I mentioned this in the Casey Musgraves episode, but if anyone didn't listen to that, you know, I sort of have been coming to you to get recommendations for these lesser known artists that sort of have the country leanings, even if, you know, Jason Isbell might still have quite a bit of rock in his music, which with the way mainstream country is, I don't really necessarily care if people consider themselves country and have, you know, like rock or pop in their music. And Right. Well, I think that at this point, the genre is so like... It's just sprawling, right? Um, like, and and I I don't really like the argument like of, oh, this isn't country or this is like a lot of people will say like the the stuff on country radio isn't country, but like, you know, if people think it is, it it kind of is. Like, it's genres are just that's really the only thing that decides genres. Like, there aren't like, like uh, inherent boundaries or anything between music. And no artist writes with the purpose of being in a genre. So, like, for me, it's all just, like, sort of all, like, a collection of the folk stuff and the country stuff and the Americana stuff and, like, 
the more rock tinge stuff. It all sort of just fits into like, uh, like I'll just throw stuff in that country thread, even though even if it do, it's not like down the middle, like classic country, right? Uh, just because I th- I feel like it, you know if I like it, then then people who are posting in that thread will probably like it as well, and you know that's that, like that's all that's all I really care about. Um, yeah, and that thread definitely and I, like, shies away from the mainstream a lot more. I know we've mentioned, oh, yeah. you know, like Carrie definitely. Underwood, Miranda Lambert, Zach Brown Band, and the ones that are played on the radio very frequently, and, you know, the ones that play Stagecoach and everything. So I would say that the thread definitely has people who like very different things. And while I personally love a lot of the mainstream artists, I'm still interested in, you know, finding out about people like Jason Isbell, Marin Morris, and, you know, obviously she's blown up now, but, you know, that's a little different because... Well, that's, the, that's kind of the thing that keeps happening. Like, everyone, like, all these artists that used to be under the radar, like, like if you think the Stapleton was under the radar for a while and then he blew up. Right. Marin Morris, like, put out an EP in late 2015 and she was sort of a nobody and then she blew up. And then Sturgill Simpson got a, a an album of the year Grammy nomination, and he he sort of blew up. So it's like it keeps happening, um, and like Isbell's already like I wouldn't call him under the radar anymore. He definitely used to be, but uh, you know he's got a big following too. And uh, I'm glad to see that a lot of people are embracing these artists and recognizing that there is like talent and validity in country music whatever you want to call it because for a very long time like growing up I knew a lot of people who were on the like well I like everything but country yes I still know people um, who are like that (laughs) yeah yeah there there I mean there are a lot of people like that like just but even on chorus like in absolute punk and like seeing how that narrative has sort of changed in the past like five years right is, is pretty you know pretty amazing because like it used to be like i remember i don't know 2012 or something greg robson would post like country reviews on absolute punk and people would just be assholes about it they're like what why is this being reviewed on here like it's it's not absolute country um (laughs) so that would happen a lot and then there just wasn't much of an audience for it and now like that country thread gets like it gets bumped every couple of days and like yeah. people recommending new stuff and just discovering new stuff. And like, I feel like, you know, Jason Isbell was sort of instrumental in making that happen. Like in just, he definitely was for me. Um, like I'd never been against country or anything. I was, I grew up loving a lot of the like folk and Americana stuff. That's like one step away from country, but okay. like, um, you know, he just, he, he Him and Dave Cobb, like, sort of opened my eyes to how much good stuff there was, like, in modern country. And then I think that sort of, like, has has happened to people on our site as a whole um, to the point where now everyone is is sort of changing their mind about it. But he was definitely, like, him and and Sturgill were sort of the, the first few that were, were, were changing that narrative because they don't sound like the radio at all right um but they're still like indebted to like that genre and its history yeah and we definitely talked about something similar with casey musgraves because she definitely represents a lot of the old-timey country and that sort of thing where you know she's probably not going to get played nearly as much as tim mcgraw faith hill carrie underwood and the current artists that are still making music just because she doesn't have quite that radio sound. I know we mentioned hearing some of her songs on the radio, but do you think Jason Isbell will ever get to that point where he makes an appearance here and there on country radio? Or do you think he still might hit more of the alternative rock sort of stations? You know, I think it's going to be hard for him. Like even Stapleton doesn't get played and, you know, he... He gets played a lot here on the country stations though. Really? Really? Yeah. I almost never hear him up here. And he just, like, I'm going more off, like, reading the charts, I guess. Okay. Because I've been sort of following, um, 
like the airplay like they didn't do a lead single for um his new record which was sort of weird like right either way is the first single and no one heard it until the day the album came out yeah i think for him parachute was the big song that kept getting played here because well i don't listen to the radio too often because i'm not in my car a whole lot anymore as it is but right, my yeah. mom listens to country radio practically all day and she was like oh this song's been played like a lot and I, so that's kind of the only way i know which in california that's kind of funny though because when you think of country music you don't necessarily think of california right right no parachute definitely got played uh traveler got played a little bit nobody to blame got a little bit of airplane what they yeah. should have done is released tennessee whiskey as a single the day after the cmas that would have blown up yes i don't think jason necessarily has a song like that um because he just like he's he's less of a crowd pleaser i guess in terms of like his voice because stapleton can can sing anything and any like you'll get it you know like anyone can can appreciate that voice. Um, Isbel, I think you really need to sort of listen to his lyrics for his songs to like have that effect. Uh, and I don't really think there's a, a, a an obvious radio single on this new album. Right. Like the one they picked, which is uh, "Hope the High Road," that's probably like the best the best chance he has for getting played on the radio but um i i don't think he'll get airplay for it if i'm being honest for anything on this album but i do think you know like i think he's got a shot at a grammy nomination for album of the year like after sturgill and uh stapleton both got in there like i think you know there's obviously a voting contingent who is um now who wants to nominate these records and wants to nominate these artists. Um, so I wouldn't be entirely surprised if we see something like that happen. Like, obviously, he'll be up against Stapleton, and maybe they'll split the vote, and neither of them will get in, or something like that. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm i rooting for him, because like, I feel like this album is not only good, but is important, in that it's sort of a very nuanced, uh, not-quite-protest rock, but sort of like it has, it has those messages and like it 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 sort of you know takes a look at both sides of the political conversation I guess because like on the one hand there's a song like White Man's World which is obviously against like oppression and sexism and and stuff like that but then like a lot of his songs are sort of like from the perspective of like people in these rural communities that you know like the people who were sort of disenfranchised with like the Obama administration and then turned around and voted for Trump. Right. So I think he's covering both sides of that conversation. I talk about this a lot more in my review, so you'll, you'll get to hear my thoughts more on that. But um, it, it's, it's definitely a record where he's not like giving easy answers or painting things in black and white. So um, I think, I think it's an album. A lot of people are going to really appreciate. I think it's going to get great reviews um, and there's just a lot to dissect, um, even more so than the previous two. And I think it's, like I said, it's more cohesive and more thematic. So, um, you know, maybe this is the one that, like, he starts selling, he starts, like, doing some arena shows or something. I don't know. He definitely could. Um, I don't know if he'll stay, like, a, 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 a smaller artist with a very dedicated fan base or, or what, but, you know, I'm sort of fine either way on that. And I don't think he cares about getting airplay either. So, um, you know, whatever happens. Yeah, I was just curious on your thoughts on that, because I don't know if country radio is necessarily the same for me as it is for you or anywhere else, really, because, like I said, Chris Stapleton was getting quite a bit of airplay because my mom hadn't listened to his album at all, but she knew at least three or four songs off of Traveler because they were getting right. played on the radio here. And, you know, I still kind of think it's funny that Stagecoach takes place here, because 
when you think of states, I want to say California and like New York feel like the least country places you could possibly get. I think I think New York would win that. Like there are some California country artists that are really, uh, really pretty great. And I think like there because there's the whole there's like the Laurel Canyon sound, which is sort of one step away from country. And um, but like New York is just like maybe upstate New York. I don't know. Yeah, it's like, you know, maybe if you go to the middle of nowhere in these states, <laughs> you'll find that sort of feeling of the, the country, basically. But there are still a ton of country fans here because, I mean, I know people will come from out of state to go to Stagecoach and stuff. And that's sort of the same with, I want to say, a lot of festivals, especially the big ones like Lollapalooza, Bamboozle, oh, yeah. whatever. I know because Bamboozle was in Jersey, you would get people from, you know, Pennsylvania, New York, wherever, because there everything is so close. But here it just sort of makes me laugh. I'm like, where did all these country fans come from? Because I don't know like any of them, because a lot of my friends are so focused on, you know, pop, rap, rock, and those other genres right. that are heavily focused on out here especially in LA I wouldn't say you know LA is very country centric by any means that's what Nashville's for basically <laughs> and you know I think Jason Isbell will do just fine if he doesn't get any airplay on this record because we've seen the progress he's made from Southeastern and something more than free I think this record will still do really well for him, and especially if he does do a full album stream on a site like NPR or something like that. I feel like anytime NPR is paying attention to you, you have something good going. Right. And I think a lot of those streams do really well, too. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, he'll be he'll definitely be fine either way. Like, he's he, he sells out his tours, and he can tour really big venues at this point. And, um, you know, he's, ob he's obviously happy with his life and is, is, has, has been very prolific, as you said, and very c consistent about putting records out every two years. So like, it just seems to me like he's a guy who loves writing songs and loves performing and doesn't really, doesn't really care about airplay. And I think just in general, country radio and radio across the board matters less now. So, like, even if he doesn't get played, you know, doesn't mean he can't, like, be nominated for these awards or, you know, s like, top top a few charts or uh, anything like that. So, you know, he'll, he'll be okay. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think that wraps up what I have for you today. I know you and I could probably go on all day about country music, especially... <laughs> With right, as many right. new artists and everything that have been popping up, but I will definitely keep you updated as I revisit these albums. You know, while we were sitting here recording, I had three podcasts download though, so we'll see when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. Awesome. Well, thank you for coming on, Craig. Yep, thanks for having me. It's always a great conversation, and to our listeners. As always, thank you for listening. If you could spread the word about the podcast in any way, I won't ask you to review it because I don't know if that necessarily helps spread the word to get some reviews on mm -hmm. iTunes. But if you enjoy the podcast, just tell a friend about it. Just one friend. That's all I ask. And if you guys do that, that would be awesome. If you want to tweet about it, post it on Facebook, that would be great too. But either way, thank you for listening and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day.